melanoma and conditions that can cause it, such as CMN. He serves as the lead physician and principal investigator for a melanoma study at the NIH performing skin cancer screening exams and investigating for more genetic causes of melanoma. In addition to his clinical responsibilities, Dr. Sargent has led multiple research projects characterizing the clinical and histologic features of melanoma-prone families. So he's here to talk today about his research involving CMN. Dr. Sargent, uh, you can take it away if you're ready. Sure, uh, thanks for having me. Um, doesn't look like I can turn on my camera, um, but I don't have permission to do that, but, uh, um, but so I'll just, I'll leave it off for right now. Um, so thank you for having me and uh, for the opportunity uh, to discuss some of the research studies that we're developing um, at NIH for uh, congenital melanocytic nevi. Let me um, share my slides. Okay. Okay. Um, so before I begin, I have uh, no conflicts of interest uh, related to the topics that I'll be discussing today, and the views expressed in this talk are my own and should not be interpreted to reflect the views or policies of the National Cancer Institute. Um, so in the first part of this talk, I'm briefly going to uh, review the clinical and genetic features of large and giant congenital melanocytic nevi, and this will provide some context for some of the research studies that we're developing including a clinical trial uh, and a natural history study. Um, so large and giant congenital melanocytic nevi are tumors uh, of melanocytes, which are the cells in your skin that produce melanin pigment. And these lesions develop during pregnancy and grow to a diameter of at least 20 centimeters in adulthood. Uh, this is a rare condition uh, with an incidence of one uh, per 20,000 to one in 500,000 live births. Uh, and these patients are, are monitored closely by uh, pediatric dermatologists because there's about a five to 10% uh, risk um, that the about five to 10% of these patients will develop melanoma, which is a potentially aggressive form of skin cancer. Um, Central nervous system abnormalities are also common in patients with large and giant congenital melanocytic nevi. So MRI studies show that about 20 to 50% of these patients will have some abnormality detected. Most often these are asymptomatic uh, deposits of melanocytes, uh, but they can also include structural abnormalities such as cysts and certain tumors. And as we know, pain and itching can be a major cause of distress uh, for patients uh, with this condition. And we don't fully understand what causes these symptoms, but we think it's related to intrinsic factors within the nevus itself. And we know from prior molecular studies that genetic alterations that activate this MAP kinase pathway shown here are critical to the development of these uh, congenital nevi. And so potentially if we could block this pathway, this would be an effective treatment for this condition. And there's uh, data to support this hypothesis. So this was a study that was published about 10 years ago of mice with an NRAS mutation, and these mice developed giant congenital melanocytic nevi. And so in this study, the investigators treated these mice with a MEK inhibitor solumendib, and it was able to shrink these giant congenital nevi in mice and also reduce melanocytes within the central nervous system, suggesting that it would, could be an effective treatment uh, in humans. There's also human data as well. This was a, a report that was published several years ago of a seven-year-old patient with a giant congenital nevus caused by this acap 9 BRAF fusion. Um, a fusion is when two genes are abnormally stuck together, and that can result in activation of one or both genes. So in this case, this fusion activates this BRAF gene, which then activates the MAP kinase pathway leading to nevus development. And so this patient was having severe itching and pain related to her nevus. And so to manage those symptoms, her doctors uh, treated her with Tremendib, which is another MEK inhibitor, and that uh, resolved her itching and pain within one month of starting treatment. And at six months, it had decreased the thickness of her nevus by about 50%, which is shown uh, in the MRI images on the right. So panel C is the MRI image from before treatment, and then panel F is the MRI image um, after six months with the arrow showing the thickness of the nevus. 
And so we hypothesize that um, uh, if we block this MAP kinase pathway with a MEK inhibitor, this would be an effective treatment strategy for um, large and giant congenital melanocytic nevi. So what are the potential benefits of decreasing the size of these lesions? Well, one, it could potentially reduce melanoma risk. If you shrink these lesions enough, there are fewer melanocytes that then can transform potentially into cancer. And if we can shrink these lesions enough, it may allow for surgical excision of the residual nevus. MEK inhibitors are approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration uh, for the treatment of multiple tumors, both benign and malignant, including brain tumors and melanoma. Uh, Siamednib is a MEK inhibitor that was recently approved by the FDA for the treatment of unresectable plexiform neurofibromas, which are benign nerve tumors that typically develop in children. Uh, and they were approved because they were able to shrink the tumors and there was a durable response to treatment. And it also improved symptoms such as pain. Overall, Siamednib was well tolerated in these children with the most common side effects being nausea and diarrhea. Uh, and these drugs are not chemotherapy. So patients, uh, when they're on them, don't lose their hair and have other side effects that we typically associate with uh, chemotherapy. So I am currently developing a clinical trial, Cybendib, for large and giant congenital molestic nevi with my collaborator, Dr. Mario Yo, who's a pediatric oncologist here um, at the MCI. So why are MEK inhibitor clinical trials needed? Um, so these trials will allow us to evaluate clinical responses to treatment. Uh, and also, this will allow us to generate data in a systematic way that we can then submit to regulatory bodies such as the FDA, uh, which is uh, hopefully, if this drug is effective, will then lead to FDA approval of this medication uh, for uh, uh, large and giant congenital molestic nevi. Um, and you know, FDA approval, as many of you are aware, is an important step for making sure that insurance uh, covers this medication for patients. So for this uh, trial, um, our goal is to enroll at least 10 patients, although we can enroll up to 15 patients. Uh, patients are eligible if they're between the ages of three and 40 years and have a nevus with an adult projected diameter of at least 20 centimeters. And so we use growth curves to um, project the adult size uh, in children. Patients with neurocutaneous melanocytosis can participate in this trial if they're asymptomatic. Um, so for example, if you have a history of seizures related to a structural abnormality, as long as those seizures are well controlled on medication, you could still participate in this uh, clinical trial. Um, patients will be treated with Siamendib at the FDA approved dose uh, for 24 treatment cycles. Each treatment cycle is one month, so for a total of two years. The primary outcome that we'll be evaluating in this clinical trial are changes in surface diameter, so we'll compare the diameter of the nevus at the end of the trial compared to pretreatment. Some of the secondary outcomes that we'll be evaluating are changes in tumor thickness, which will be evaluated by MRI, and changes in patient-reported outcomes such as itching and pain. So the Vectra whole body 3D imaging machine shown here um, is a technology that we'll be using to evaluate changes in the nevus uh, during the trial. So this machine is comprised of multiple high-definition cameras and it allows for 3D image capture of skin lesions. And so using this technology, we can not only monitor changes in diameter, but we can also measure surface area and topography as well, including changes in height of the skin lesions. Uh, and there's no radiation uh, involved with this, uh, with this machine. Um, there are very few of these machines in the country, but one of them happens to be at the Innova Healthcare Facility in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a, a short drive from here at NIH. Um, and so we are partnering with them for this clinical trial in order to have access to this technology for the trial. Uh, during the trial, participants will be closely monitored by NIH physicians, including pediatric oncology, uh, dermatology, and neurology, uh, and routine blood work will be performed to evaluate for side effects of treatment. Uh, we anticipate that this medication could reduce risk for melanoma, but if there are lesions that are clinically suspicious for melanoma during the trial, surgery will be a call to perform biopsies of those lesions. Here's a study calendar giving an overview of the trial. So trial participants uh, will be initially seen before starting treatment and then every four cycles, so every four months uh, until the 24th cycle. After the 24th cycle, if patients are responding well to treatment and wanna continue with therapy, they can do so 
under the uh, joint management of both NIH physicians and their local physicians. Um, but patients can also stop treatment after 24 months if they decide they don't want to continue. Uh, and regardless of that decision, patients will be monitored at six month, inter six month intervals for an additional year after the 24 treatment cycle. During these uh, clinical center visits, patients will be seen by multiple specialties and undergo uh, MRI imaging as well. Uh, there is a significant time commitment with this trial. So uh, this trial will involve visits to the NIH every four months uh, for two years while on treatment. We try to minimize the impact of these visits on everyday life. So typically we have clinic visits on Mondays, so patients and families can travel over the weekend to minimize the disruption as much as possible to school and work. NIH will pay for all travel costs, um, as well as any procedures, laboratory tests, and clinical evaluations that are part of the clinical trial. Uh, this trial, our protocol, uh, recently successfully completed scientific review at the NIH, uh, which is a major hurdle to, to clear. Uh, and now our protocol is, um, uh, is being reviewed by the NIH Institutional Review Board. Uh, and we anticipate opening the trial for enrollment in 2024 and the data generated from this trial will inform the design and endpoints of a larger trial, phase two trial that we would be developing uh, after the completion of this initial trial. Lastly, in addition to the clinical trial, we also have our natural history study for congenital levine. This study does not require any travel to the NIH. We can send patients over the phone. Uh, and then once patients are consented, we would request medical records from outside uh, facilities and also uh, any prior biopsies of the nevus that have been performed so that we can perform molecular studies. Uh, because one of the major goals of this natural history study is to characterize the, the genetic alterations within the nevus and to correlate those findings with certain outcomes such as melanoma development, as well as uh, uh, things such as neurocutaneous melanocytosis. Initially, um, our goal is to enroll patients with large and giant congenital melanocytic nevi uh, in this um, natural history study. And those patients enrolled in the natural history study are the ones that we'll reach out to initially about the clinical trial when it's open for enrollment. But we're also interested in enrolling um, patients with a smaller nevi that are at least 10 centimeters in diameter or patients with multiple uh, congenital nevi that are five or more centimeters in diameter. So uh, we hope that you'll consider you know, participating in this trial, which is now open, uh, or this study, which is now open for enrollment. If you are, there's the website shown here, and you can, um, there's a one-page application where you um, uh, submit your uh, name as well as contact information, and a member of our research team will, will contact you. Um, I just want to acknowledge our, my key collaborators on, this, on these studies. Uh, and here's my email address. You know, if people have questions, they can also reach out to me directly. Um, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Sargent you should be able to turn your camera on. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, sorry, we changed it. Um, if anyone has any questions, now would be a great time. You can either type them into the Q&A or you can raise your hand and I'll try to be able to unmute you if you'd prefer to speak out loud. Um, I think one question that we had received initially was, what is the expected time commitment of the MyPART registry? So really minimal. The, the major commitment is up front uh, with the informed consent, uh, which is usually about a, a 20 to 30 minute phone call. Uh, we, we FedEx the consent documents to families. And then once we have those consent documents signed, uh, we take care of the rest. So we request medical records, we'll request um, any biopsies from outside laboratories. Great. And then Kathleen, I'll let you speak now. Unmute. Hi, quick question. Are people outside of the U.S. allowed to participate in the natural history study? So yes, for the natural history study. Um, it's a little bit more complicated and, and um, we don't have a final decision on that yet, but for the clinical trial, the uh, IRB here is probably not gonna allow international patients. Okay, thank you. Yep. Let 
And then I think someone also asked if you could put your email address in the chat right. as well. And um, also, if, if, if you just Google my name, all federal employees, our email address is also publicly available. So um, you can also, if you, if you uh, lose track of it, you can, uh, you can find my email address online. Um, I think I typed it in the chat. Hopefully I did that correctly. And Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we'll also be um, sharing further about the the two um, that Dr. Sargent mentioned with everybody. So you'll continue to see that information and, and have access to those details. Yes, we just wanted to have a recording um, here. So this is what this conference is for, to produce this information and just make sure that as we share information, we can link back to this recording for people who wanted a more in-depth um, look at the clinical trials because there is a lot of details as associated with it that we felt like Dr. Sargent would be the best to articulate. So thank you, Dr. Sargent, for joining us today and making that possible. Um, and then we had another question. Is the my part the parallel program to the registry that Nevis Outreach is doing? Um, Lauren, or maybe you'd be best to answer this one since I think you're the one who mentioned that a few days ago. Um, sure. So we are aware of the Mar My Part study, and Dr. Sargent has graciously um, agreed to join a working group uh, for the purpose of developing a CMN registry project that would be IRB approved and would uh, parallel in some ways to this natural history study. We just uh, realize that there is some value in being able to collate data when when some uh, patients may not be captured by this NIH. Uh, natural history study uh, just because of their size of their NEVA or other things that they may not meet. But uh, we are interested in, at the end of the day, just collecting as much data as we can to move science forward as quickly as we can. And we know that a patient registry, um, regardless of um, where that information lives on a computer somewhere, um, is the best way to move research forward. So we appreciate Dr. Sargent's collaboration in that effort and um, all the other physicians that are making that possible. Yeah, and, and I should just add also, um, you know, primarily the natural history studies for research, but once patients are enrolled, um, if there are biopsies that are done in the future and um, there needs to be an evaluation, the, both the, either the pathology or a molecular testing of the, of the biopsy needs to be done, that can all be done in our clinical laboratory here as part of the natural history study, and we can return those results to healthcare providers to assist with uh, diagnosis and treatment decisions. Um, so um, we we also you know can be sort of a supporting um, uh, entity for uh, clinical care on the outside as well. And all those costs are covered by um, by NIH. So patients and families wouldn't receive a bill, and, and insurance isn't billed for any testing that we do as part of the natural history study. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we just again appreciate you being a very collaborative uh, partner in this process as we navigate um, just rapidly evolving science and wanted to make sure that our Nevis patients are at the forefront and to benefit from all that. So appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for working with us. All right, I think we have another question if you're still able to answer one more. Mm -hmm. um, does the NIH ever get any international patients from outside the US? I think you might've addressed that, but if you could just answer it one more time, or Nevis patients in particular. Yes, so we do, um, and, and we can certainly enroll them on the natural history study. It, it gets a little bit more complicated with clinical trials because of the frequency of visits, um, and so, um, and certainly there are, there are families and patients abroad who have the means to come every four months, but NIH typically likes trial participants to be in the continental U.S. in case there are complications so that there are local healthcare providers they can see. Um, so we don't, I don't have a final uh, decision yet from the NIH IRB about that, but uh, my suspicions are gonna say no to international patients for at least the trial part, but for the natural history study, we absolutely can enroll them. 
Great. Thank you so much. Um, I know we have limited time, but of course, everyone, sorry, I'm offering, but feel free to email either Nevis Outreach or Dr. Sargent if you have further questions. And again, we'll continue to push out more updates about both of these studies as they continue growing. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so up next, we have a presentation from Dr. Elena Halruk, who's a, trained in both pediatric and adult dermatology. She has a special interest in pigmented lesions, including melanoma, various forms of nevi, including CMN, um, and other pigmentary birthmarks. She's authored both primary research and research review articles on melanoma and pigmented lesions, and she's delivered presentations at regional and national meetings on these topics. Um, so I'll just be playing a video with Dr. Hallrick's presentation. Hello, Nevis Outreach. Thank you so much for the invitation to present today. I'm really excited to be here and share with you some research and clinical trials updates from my own work and from the literature. My name is Elena Howerluck. I'm a pediatric dermatologist. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I practice at Harvard Medical School. Um, my disclosures are listed. I'm an author and reviewer, a consultant, and I do have a research collaboration, which I'm excited to talk a little bit more about today. And I received funding from the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance, the Career Bridge Award that supports my efforts on congenital nevi research. And I'd like to start first and foremost by acknowledging and thanking my congenital nevi patients, and one in particular who's pictured here. Um, so this is the nevus um, of a patient who I've cared for for over a decade. And this patient has really changed my career path. Um, I came to learn from her all of the different things that she had done and tried with various doctors over the course of decades to try to treat her congenital nevus. And I came to learn from her that she was coming to me for care of her nevus and management over time where our goals were to keep her skin safe and healthy and comfortable, um, to monitor and to look for melanoma, um, to manage some of the skin consequences that she had from treatments for melanoma that made her itchy and dry, keep her comfortable and provide support. And so that was a big lesson for me. And definitely this patient impacted my career and has inspired me to really work hard to take better care of our congenital nevi patients. She would be so thrilled to know that I'm here with you today. Typically, I see patients in two different settings in the outpatient clinic most frequently at Mass General and Boston Children's Hospital. Um, I take care of patients who are primarily pediatric, though at Mass General, I see congenital nevi patients and melanoma patients of any age. And if you're looking for me um, in a consultation, it's most likely because you've come across some of our research and are interested to see how it's impacted the clinic. So I've met several of you through this avenue and thank you for finding me. Um, the paper that has brought many people to the clinic recently is this paper from Cell in 2022, where I worked along with my chair, Dr. David Fisher, and his brilliant laboratory on identifying topical therapy for regression and melanoma prevention of giant congenital nevi. This was a cell paper, and it's very exciting, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about it today. Um, to do that, first, I'd like to introduce you to a mouse with a congenital nevus. And here we see two mice at birth, where one has a nevus and has darker pigment. And you can see these mice over time and how this pigment is distributed differently on their skin. And you can even see this on their um, foot pads here. This mouse on the right has the congenital nevus actually developing proliferative nodules. And these mice actually can also develop melanoma. And that's one of the reasons why they're so valuable to help us learn more about congenital nevi. 
So these were the mice that were studied in this paper that we'll tell you more about. It turns out that both, both mice and humans um, make nevi that look similar under the microscope. So when a mouse and a human both have a skin biopsy, you can see here the human on top. Um, you can see the brown pigment, and these are bigger cells aggregating in little nevus nests, we call them. And here on the bottom, you can see nests of nevi in the mouse cell with pigment um, that is dark in the, the cells and the areas around them in the dermis, so the deeper layer of the skin here. So in this paper, we looked at topical targeted inhibitors and found that they can regress nevi in mice. how they signal so that we can improve disease. And for congenital nevi, we think about certain pathways that are activated that lead to increased melanocytes and pigmentation. Um, you may be familiar of some patients seeking targeted therapies that they take for their entire body. So they take these by mouth or injection, and this therapy can affect their whole body, not just the nevus. And that can lead to a lot of side effects. And so that's something that's very important to study and understand better. Um, we also worry about harmful effects of these medicines in areas where we don't necessarily want them to go. So wouldn't it be fantastic if we could use these targeted therapies topically and put them right on the nevus where we want to treat? And so that was the idea behind this paper. And it turns out in my skin, it is able to have some effects, but in human skin, unfortunately, there are definitely barriers in terms of absorption and effectiveness that we're able to see. And these medicines aren't very effectively given through a topical um, plan right now. So here we see a mouse before treatment and after treatment um, for two different inhibitors and how um, you can see lightening of the pigment as an effect of this medicine. So this brings us to how we can adjust the topical treatment and maybe make it more effective. And one of the ideas that came up was using squaric acid. Squaric acid is also called SADB. It stands for squaric acid dibutyl ester, um, but I'll call it squaric acid for now. And this is a medicine that we actually already use in pediatric dermatology. It's a sensitizing agent that induces a delayed type hypersensitivity response and it activates cutaneous immune mediators or signals in the body. So what does that mean in English? Um, so it's a sensitizer or a solution that you put on the skin and it causes a reaction that in an extreme form is almost like coming in contact with poison ivy. So you get come in contact with poison ivy and oil goes on your skin and that causes a lot of inflammation, sometimes blistering and itching. And so the idea behind squaric acid is using it at a very dilute concentration so that you don't get as much blistering and itch and, and adverse effect, but you still get some of the signal changes. So squaric acid is something that we already use in pediatric dermatology. We use it for patients that have many, many warts and don't want to undergo freezing or destructive approaches. So kids generally don't like those very much. So we have found some good use for squaric acid. And it turns out, um, basically, the patients come in and we treat them with a stronger concentration, for example, on their forearm to sensitize their body. And if they have a reaction, they can use a very low concentration rate on the warts and help the immune system find the warts and clear the warts. Um, the data shows, actually, that if you're using this for many weeks, like at least seven weeks, you have a good chance of clearing in almost two-thirds or three-quarters of patients and seeing significant improvements, um, sometimes complete clearance. Um, but that's actually really promising to activate the immune system and see these types of positive effects on the warts. This is also used in pediatric alopecia areata. That's a type of hair loss where the immune system um, gets a little bit confused and starts to attack the hair follicles. Hmm, pardon me. Um, so here we have two patients who have kindly agreed for me to share their photos of alopecia areata. 
It can start as these round patches without hair and even progress to involve the whole scalp. And so we similarly use um, squaric acid for these patients. I have one of my patients who kindly provided demonstration pictures. We painted in a square. This is um, just skin pen on, this, on the skin to mark the square. First, we rubbed the skin with um, a tongue depressor to kind of activate the skin there. And then we use a Q-tip to apply squaric acid solution that feels like a runny liquid. We apply a tegaderm bandage to keep the liquid in place, and then they wash it off the next day. At home, this causes generally a little bit of itch and, and redness. Um, some patients have a very robust reaction and have a little bit more um, blistering or even scaling there. And oftentimes it leaves some extra pigment in the skin as it heals. So here, two weeks later, you know, there was some redness in between. And when they came back, you can still see where the square was. It leaves a little bit of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, but we know that this is enough of a reaction that we can use the very dilute medicine right where we need it for this patient. And an alopecia areata, it works a little bit differently. It's thought that the reaction, because of the squaric acid, will distract the immune system to allow the hairs to then grow again at their original place. And actually, squaric acid has been pretty effective for alopecia areata in a subset of patients. Um, there was a nice study where patients under 13 years of age who had really extensive and recalcitrant alopecia areata um, were first sensitized, and then they used once a week application of squaric acid for a full year. And over half of them had significant regrowth, um, sometimes even complete regrowth with that course, which is pretty amazing. Um, so back to the study where we decided to use squaric acid on mice, and I got to advise these amazing investigators in the lab on how we use it in children so that we could come up with a safe protocol for how to treat the mice in a similar way. And so here is the mouse ear, the left ear versus the right ear, where the left ear had a control, which was just acetone. That's the solution that the squaric acid is diluted in. And then on the right, the right ear had squaric acid. And you can see right off the bat, the pigment is significantly reduced. And we found that mice nevi treated with squaric acid had reduced melanocytes. So those are the mole or nevus cells. Um, so additional studies looking at um, kind of the effects of the squaric acid. Again, we've got the control on the left and the squaric acid on the right. You can see the pigmentation difference between the treated and the control group. Um, when they did biopsies to look at the mouse cells, they could find that when you had the squaric acid treatment, there were less melanocytes and there was less melanin or pigment. And so overall, this is basically reduction of the nevus. And in fact, these mice actually had reduced numbers of melanomas. So that's really impressive and incredible from a solution given topically on, on a nevus. Um, so a summary of this treatment, and this is a nice picture to summarize, we had in step one, a nevus, which is a collection of melanocytes before treatment. Um, in step two, the squaric acid is placed on the skin surface and it activates some signals in response under the skin, including cells called macrophages, um, which are involved in removing the nevus. And step three, after treatment, you can see the nevus is actually completely regressed and gone. And so that was pretty incredible to see topically. And so the question comes, how can this be studied in humans? And the answer is with a clinical trial. Um, so this is something that we're still getting rolling at Mass General, but I wanted you to be aware of it, um, and it hopefully will give us some exciting information. Um, because this hasn't been done on Nevis before, it's restricted to adult patients only as we're learning about this, and ideally, over time, we'll be able to um, do this type of study on our patients of any age. And this is for patients who are planning to have a Nevis removed not because the nevus is doing something dangerous or worrisome, because obviously then you just remove the nevus rather than do you know, many weeks of squaric acid treatment before removing it. But for those patients who are, who are removing part of the nevus or an entire nevus for other reasons, um, such as location or um, other symptoms that may be more um, 
less time pressing in terms of when their procedure is done. And so basically these patients would be able to come see us for their initial visit and sensitization. The treatment's done at home with monitoring using a telemedicine type visit. And eventually um, once the topical treatment course is completed, um, there's a little break of time before the nevus is completely removed. And then that tissue can be studied to document whether they're seeing the same effects in human as we're seeing in the mice studies. So that's a really cool project to see come forward and also creates a nice way to test new topicals or different treatments on top of the skin in the future. Um, I do want to mention that innovations in clinical care are absolutely a two-way street. So you just heard an example of how ideas from other types of conditions are influencing care for our congenital nevus patients and new ideas and new treatments. Um, and I wanted to share one way and a new piece of data that came out that congenital nevi really have um, inspired a new area of study. And some of you may have come across this headline. I saw it in the news. This was from insider.com. The title was, scientists believe that they've discovered a cure for baldness. It's hiding in your hairy moles and can be injected like Botox. It turns out that this group from California um, published this article in Nature just in June of 2023, where they identified in melanocytes that have hair, um, this signal called oste um, sorry, osteopontin, which then can be transferred to bald areas and stimulate hair growth. And so I think about all the patients that have come to me over years saying, I really am annoyed by this hair. You know, it gets in the way when I'm putting sunscreen on my nevus. Isn't there a good way to remove the hair? Well, it turns out the fact that the hair is there is actually going to help people that want hair. So I, I think that's really cool. And the other piece to the puzzle is when we learn how to turn things on, we often learn how to turn things off. So I'm hoping that some better remedies for um, bothersome hair are right around the corner, that maybe the signal will be an on and off switch that, that we can use to take better care of our patients. Shifting gears back to the clinic. Um, one of the things that drives me more than any is how can we think about um, ways to take better care of our patients with changing nevi? And as you know, this can be very stressful. There are a lot of changes that happen naturally and normally, um, and those are fine, but then there are worrisome ones as well. And this brings us to a new test. Um, so there is a new test out. Some patients refer to it as a sticker test and it will give some information as to whether a biopsy is necessary or not. So this test involves placing stickers right on the lesion that you're worried about, and the stickers are sent to a lab to analyze the genetic material, and those genetic signals can tell you if the mole or lesion is high risk or low risk for melanoma. And this test has performed incredibly for atypical moles and melanomas to distinguish them, in adult patients. It really hasn't been studied in children and it definitely doesn't hasn't been studied in congenital nevi, but I can imagine the world where it would be so fantastic to have a changing mole or changing lesion of a patient of any age and certainly a patient with a congenital nevus who has a worrisome spot that we might be hesitant to do a procedure on to put a sticker test on it and get an answer to know, do we have to do that procedure or not? So I, I do think that's in the future and that's coming. Um, but right now we're at the point where we need to generate more data so that we understand how this test is used. Um, unfortunately, it's too soon to just jump to, to using it. And here's a patient who came to me who shares her story and wants to share with others. Um, you recognize the surface of this nevus as one that has a cobblestone pattern. It's really common in patients who have congenital nevi. And so this lesion was tested with a sticker test and this patient is a child. And so it's not really the population where the sticker test is proven to work for. And um, unfortunately the test was actually also performed twice and once it was positive and once it was negative. So we're really in a confusing situation where we have an abnormal result for a test that really wasn't set up for this. And it creates a lot of stress in coming up with a good safe plan for the patient. Um, so this is the situation that we're trying to avoid by hopefully generating more data by taking sticker tests for lesions that are being biopsied 
so that we are able to understand how to best use a sticker test in, in the clinic. So right now we are doing this non-interventional diagnostic study for lesions that are being biopsied, both congenital nevi and other skin lesions in children, so that we have a sticker answer to match with the pathology report. We're not yet doing it in patients that aren't being biopsied, but that hopefully will come in the future to validate the approach in pediatrics and congenital nevi. Um, but that's an exciting test and hopefully some new data in the future. Um, the last point I'd like to wrap up with is patients asking about interventions. So I have patients coming to see me because they find the paper online about squaric acid and you know, they want to know when these treatments are going to be available or what else we have to offer. And we absolutely do want to do a better job. And I will say that the way that I learn best about how to help my patients and help connect them to the resources they need is from my patients. I love listening to patient experiences and I've included my email. I would love your feedback on this talk and any thoughts that you have because it really helps me do a better job. Um, I have to warn you, I'm not the best at replying to email at times, but I do read them and I do appreciate them and the time it takes for people to reach out. Um, I've learned so much from physicians across the globe. We have physicians in different countries doing um, different types of procedures on congenital nevi with different technologies, such as cooling. Um, I have a physician um, trainee who is a master's student now who comes from Asia, who's explained to me a lot about how nevi are cared for in her part of the world with a lot of lasers and procedures that aren't as common here. And so this led us to generate a podcast, which is actually available on the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance website, which I've listed there. It's called Points of Discussion Podcast, and you'll see several series with different topics, but the one that I really enjoyed was the topic laser and congenital nevi in children. And I think the reason why I enjoyed it so much is that I could pick several experts and interview them and ask them the questions that I would love to hear as well. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested and certainly share your experiences with me. I find for my patients, a multidisciplinary approach is the way to go. Um, I'm not the person that does surgery or laser. And so oftentimes I'm collecting data and connecting people to the resources that they need and they're interested in. So I definitely wanna thank my colleagues who take amazing care of our patients together. Um, surgically, I work closely with Dr. Bronko Boyevich and um, for lasers with Dr. Rox Anderson and Dr. Yakir Levine to take care of patients over time. And, you know, the technologies and approaches are just improving and our tools are just expanding at an amazing pace. So I'm really hopeful that we're able to work together collaboratively um, to help our patients come up with the perfect plan for them. And whether that plan is me watching and babysitting in the clinic, which is one of my favorite things to do, or exploring with some of these experts on the tools that they have and what they can offer. You know, I think that the right plan is the plan that you come up with together for, you know, your family or your patient or your yourself in the case that you're the owner of the Nevis. Um, and I'm just delighted to be part of the process. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to especially thank Pedro for supporting um, my research interest in congenital nevi, and I hope everybody has a great day. Great. Um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Halrick again for that great presentation. It sounds like there's a lot of new research and new treatments that are in the work, which is really exciting. Um, so thank you again doc to Dr. Halrook. Um, our next presentation and our final one for this session is by Maggie Mangold. She's a medical doctor highly involved in Nevis Outreach. She has volunteered with our organization for several years now, um, and her particular interest in CMN stems from her son being born with a Nevis a few years ago. She currently serves on the Nevis Outreach Board of Directors, and she's the chair of our research committee. So Maggie will be talking a little more about Nevis, Out Nevis Outreach's role in upcoming research projects. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you were able to join us this evening. 
My name is Maggie Mangold. I am a Nevis mom. I am on the board of directors and I am the chair of the research committee. And I'm here tonight to share some information about our committee, our structure, what we've been up to, and hopefully share some exciting news that you um, maybe can get excited about like we have. So without further ado, I will go ahead and share my screen. All right. So let me first introduce our committee. Our committee is made up of six individuals. Myself, I'm the committee chair, Andrea Bischoff, who is also on our board of directors. She's a clinical psychologist. Lily Hennessy, she, she was just recently accepted into medical school. Jenna Lee, recently accepted into residency, finished medical school. Jennifer Martin is a dermatologist, and Diana Olvera is also a medical student. Um, when we talk about our committee structure, um, we meet typically monthly, um, and our committee has doubled in size in the last year, which has been a very exciting thing. We've brought new varying experiences, different places of the country, and also added two members with congenital knee by themselves. Um, over the last uh, year, we gave three grants to students to attend the 2022 Nevis Outreach Conference and Reunion. This was the first that we have done this, um, and it really gave those students an, an opportunity to experience our community, to build relationships with existing researchers and physicians and to give back by working on some small projects. And um, one student also, these, these are different individuals, um, came to each of our 2023 medical conferences. So the American Academy of Dermatology and the Pedro Conference. When we look historically at Nevis Outreach and our role in research, I want to take you on a little timeline as to um, where we've been and where we are hoping to go. So Nevis Outreach is a 25-year-old organization. And in the early days of the organization, the goal was really building relationships with the medical and scientific community. Um, the people that have come before us have done a wonderful job of that. We have some very dedicated researchers and physicians who really give a lot to our organization. And in those early years, a patient registry was established. Um, some of you may remember this, um, but unfortunately, this wasn't a viable long-term registry given changing patient data requirements in different countries, um, and also the limitation that this was a patient-entered database. So um, patients would log in, put in what they knew about themselves, but there was no verification as far as um, if, if the things put in there matched what was in the medical record. So as our registry um, was really no longer working, um, we kind of shifted roles for a while. And over the last decade or so, the Nevis Outreach Research Committee has shifted that focus to supporting research. So grants were given. Um, each year, we would put out a request for proposals, and we would have researchers um, approach us with their proposals. And these grants were small, typically in the five to $10,000 range. Um, and we would give three or four of these each year to researchers to help augment what they were doing with research. Um, this was never enough to fully complete research. Um, research is very expensive, but it was a nice way of giving back to those researchers and um, helping them with their projects. However, um, the, the committee has decided to shift some focus um, from giving small grants to really strengthening our ability to engage with the medical and scientific community. And some of the rationale behind that, um, so research is very expensive, um, hundreds, thousands of dollars, millions per, you know, we could say, um, to really fund a, a good research project. So our five or $10,000 in grants, while helpful, 
was not having quite the impact that we 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 would hope. Um, and we feel that shifting that focus to spending that money on engagement with the scientific and medical community and collaboration will have a larger impact. So, so what does that look like? Um, this is spending our money on advocacy or pushing the federal government for funding for our projects, writing letters of support to different researchers so that they can go and get that funding that they're looking for. Um, spending money going to scientific gatherings and engaging with the researchers and the scientists, looking at membership databases. How, how do we get our toe back in that water, but also be in compliance with, with changing laws? Um, and then supporting ongoing and upcoming clinical trials. How can we as an organization best interact with those researchers? So this is really this shifting focus of our committee um, to more of a collaborative approach. So as we talk about that, one of the strategic um, endeavors that the board of directors undertook was membership. I'm sure all of you have seen these. Um, hopefully you've all filled out your membership. Um, so membership was launched in the 2022 conference. And we feel that membership is very important as we look down the road to research projects. Um, this allows us to go and say, how many patients do we have? Where do these patients live? What are the age demographics? Without sharing any you know, specific patient data, just to say to a researcher when they say, well, we want to do a study on children with facial knee body. We can say, well, we have 50 that we know of. Um, so this type of membership data is really important when we communicate with researchers. It helps us communicate to clinical trials. Where, where is most, are most of our patients? Are they in the Midwest, East Coast, West Coast, South? Where do these patients live? And as they're planning for where to have um, centers to enroll these patients, that helps us know where, where it may be helpful for them to put those locations. And then if and when Nevis Outreach can launch our own patient database, this membership data can be used to recruit those that are interested. We'll have phone numbers, contact information, mailing addresses, all very important stuff as we look towards registry. So let me take you through perhaps the last year of the, the research committee and kind of share with you what our year has looked like. So many of you may have been at our Reunite conference. Um, this was the conference and reunion that was held in Denver last year. Um, we were very lucky to, again, be able to offer free consultations to patients. We had some very generous physicians who donated their time. And you can see here, we had a variety of dermatologists, surgeon and neurologists who came to our conference. Um, and as I said earlier, we did have three medical students who we brought um, and gave grants for them to come. Christiana Ali, some of you may have met her. She was working with Dr. Kaku. Taylor Ibelli, who was working with Dr. Bauer and actually presented some of her research at our conference. And Jenna Lee, who is um, who just matched in dermatology and is active on our committee. All right, then we move forward to um, November, um, the PEDRA conference. So PEDRA is the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance. This is a 10-year-old organization, and we have a very close tie with PEDRA. So when PEDRA was first starting 10 years ago, we actually helped give them some seed money to, to work on some of their um, projects and get started. And now they are a very big organization with a lot of activity and they invite us back to their conferences. So it's a really great relationship that we have with PEDRA. Um, we have a very strong strategic alliance. We're able to sit in on um, many of their uh, sessions. Um, their big focus over the last few years has been injecting the patient voice 
into research. And so what are patients curious about? What is important to our patients? And so having a seat at that table with a bunch of pediatric dermatologists who are all doing clinical research is just a great place for us to show up and be present. All right, and then we got to March, the American Academy of Dermatology. So they had their annual meeting this past year in New Orleans. It was a big conference. So um, dermatologists, both pediatric and adult, um, from around the country, um, I would say probably around the world, um, and then all of the other rare disease organizations in the skin world also come. Um, so at this meeting, we sat in on several lectures. Um, we collaborated with some new doctors that we haven't met before and made those connections, but then also had some strategic meetings during this time. So we met with um, Michael Sargent with the NIH. We met with representatives of PEDRA, so that Pediatric Derm Research Alliance. We met with Global Skin, which is a organization that supports um, skin condition groups from all around the world. Um, I had the pleasure of being able to volunteer at a rare disease um, booth for a while, a few hours one day, and met with a lot of great residents and physicians and educated them on congenital nevi. And also just got to talk to other rare disease organizations and figure out what they're doing, how they're serving their, their constituents, their members. So um, the American Academy of Dermatology is always a great time to collaborate. I know you all just heard from Michael Sargent with the NIH. And um, that has been a big focus of this last year. So engagement with the NIH, um, and we continue to be that liaison. Um, one of the things that was really great this last year was um, as a research committee, we were charged with asking, um, with, with giving a list of endpoints that our patients would be interested in as far as clinical trials. So things like how, how itchy is my nevus skin? Um, how much does it disrupt my sleep? How much does it tear? What is the hairiness level? Um, how does this impact my social interactions? All of those endpoints that maybe aren't the first thing that a researcher thinks of, but are really forefront in the minds of people with nevi. So being able to inject that patient voice into clinical trials, into questionnaires, is something that we feel so honored to be tasked with doing. All right. And then just this last month, um, Global Skin had a conference. This was attended by our employee, Whitney Casal, who runs our membership. Um, this is an ongoing collaboration with Global Skin. So again, um, Global Skin being an organization that um, supports all sorts of different kinds of skin organizations. I put this link down here and I'd like you to all jot it down if you can. I know the link's also on our website, um, but the GRID study. So, um, the GRID study is looking at the impact of skin conditions. And this study goes through September. It's an online questionnaire. Um, it's a great way for us to have to participate in research. So saying, how does your Neva, Nevis impact your day-to-day -day life? How does it impact your, your um, you know, your medical um, experience? So go ahead and hop on Global Skin's website. And if you so choose, um, fill out that questionnaire. It's a great way to participate in some clinical research. We've also had just a variety of other smaller activities that we've done. Um, in the center of this photo here is Lily Hennessy. She has been a tireless volunteer for our organization. Um, and she took on the project of 
um, taking all of the recent clinical um, and uh, clinical trials or um, reports and collecting them and um, breaking them down into patient-friendly terms. So um, it was a really big undertaking to um, look through all the medical literature and collect all of those clinical trials and data. Um, and that list will go live on our website in the very near future. And so be looking for that as a way to kind of um, see those, those studies and um, hopefully be able to understand them in a little bit more patient-friendly terms. All right. As we look here, at what are our goals? What are our goals for this committee, for um, research in general, for any of this outreach? Um, we do have some goals that I'd like to share. So, um, you know, first is to grow our community of engaged physicians and scientists. Um, we feel all research is good research and there's always room for more at the table. So um, ways that you can help if you have a physician that you adore, or that has an interest, send them away, get them involved, have them come to a conference. Um, we'd love to have more, more people interested in Nevis um, and participating with our organization. And with that, we really feel like engaging this next generation of medical students and physicians is, is very important. So as we look at the physicians that are most active in our organization, um, you know, they age with the rest of us. And so how do we get, get that next generation? Um, and so this has been a strategic effort to get those medical students and residents involved. And we hope to be able to continue that and perhaps even expand that ability to get these physicians, um, these upcoming physicians involved. Um, from the physician, the residents and the medical students that we've talked to, you know, this is this is great opportunity for them as well. They can get um, some accolades under their belt. They can make some connections for their own journey with their studies, um, and they really love to engage with patients and they love to feel like they're part of our community. And so, um, I appreciate all of you who welcomed them in at our last conference, and we hope to be able to do more of that. Um, Another goal, we want to make accessing medical research easier and more patient friendly. So letting people know what research is happening, having that membership database to be able to send out, you know, a, an email. Hey, there's this upcoming trial if you want to participate. Um, but then also making that patient friendly. How how do you understand this paper that was um, published and what does this really mean for you or for, for our patients? Um, and then we really would like to be able to establish a consortium of doctors that would regularly meet, um, share updates, collaborate on strategic projects. So we are in the works of getting this rolling where we would have physicians um, and researchers from across industries, across um, different academic centers, across different fields, dermatology, surgery, neurology, oncology, all of the things um, involved in a regular, um, you know, meeting group of um, working on projects together. And then um, really our big goal is membership and a formal registry. So um, this is what we are most excited about right now is a registry. We have been working for the last several years trying to figure out how to make a registry happen. So when we talk about a registry, it's different than a membership. So membership is just who's in your household, who perhaps has that Nevis, and how, how do you, you know, where do you live, those sorts of non-specific um, medical information, um, non-HIPAA controlled um, information. But a registry is that place where your medical information, if you so choose, would live. Um, as I said before, there used to be a registry for Nevis Outreach. Um, that registry was patient reported um, and unfortunately got to the point where it wasn't sustainable to have 
um, and meet compliance standards. So how do we set up a registry that can be compliant, that can, um, as laws change, can flex and bend and, um, and stay viable? How, how do we be good stewards of that information? Um, and then, you know, we're looking at the NIH. So the NIH is doing a um, registry. And do we duplicate that? Do we compete with that? Do we just let them do that? Um, but we spent a lot of time kind of thinking through all of those options um, and working closely. Um, our, the PEDRA Pigmented Lesions Working Group has really been the backbone of helping us figure this out. Um, so this would be Harper Price, Dr. Harper Price and Karen Coughlin have really spent an enormous amount of time on this with us. Um, and then working with Mark, Michael Sargent at the NIH, Dr. Michael Sargent, um, when we look at what the NIH wants and can have the capacity to do, it was clear that they really likely cannot capture all of our patients. Um, they, their scope, their funding is more limited than perhaps we would like to see. We would love to see a registry of everyone that wants to participate. So over lots of discussions and lots of meetings, we have decided that the best option is likely to go with what we call parallel registries, where we would have a registry as Nevis Outreach or an affiliate. Um, and the NIH would have a registry, but those would be parallel registries. So um, patients would either be selected into one or the other, depending on capacity um, and, um, you know, perhaps patient choice. Maybe they would rather be in the NIH registry than um, the Nevis Outreach registry. But it was very important to us that that data be able to be aggregated. So if a researcher wants to do research, they could take patients from either registry, um, that data, and, and pull them to have the biggest impact that we can. Um, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, but physician verified data versus patient verified data. Um, our previous registry was patient verified, patient entered. So a patient could log on into their registry and say, I have a congenital nevus and I had melanoma at age five. And that's very difficult for a researcher to use for studies because they need to verify that the data is accurate. So they would have to go and get that data and verify every piece of that data before they publish on it. Our goal would be to have this physician verified and research ready. So we would get that data. We would get the, you know, we as in the registry, whatever that may be, um, would get that data, verify it, and have it research ready so that any researcher um, could come along um, and um, apply um, to use that data. Obviously, there would be very strict what they call IRB requirements where um, that research has to be vetted. But once it is, that data would be ready to go. Um, we feel that this will make research happen, that having that data, having that registry ready to go is really the way to move forward and allow more research to happen. So this has been our big goal. This has been something we have worked very hard on over the last year, looking at all sorts of options and investigating that. Um, so we have a working group established with the P Pedro Pigmented Lesions Working Group. We're working hard towards moving that forward. But we are hoping within the near future we can um, announce a formal registry. So um, you're hearing it here first. I hope that this um, can come to be in the near future. I wish I had more details to share. It's been a long journey and a long process, but I feel like we're gonna get there and um, this will be a great thing. Obviously, this will not be a requirement to participate in any registries. You can be a member of Nevis Outreach without participating in any scientific or research um, uh, efforts. But for those who do want to participate, this will be a great option. All right. 
that's all I have for tonight. Um, I really want to thank everyone who donates to Nevis Outreach. Um, every every donation helps keep the lights on, keeps the organization running, helps keep um, us as strong as we can, lets us um, be able to um, interact with um, all the different researchers and um, host things like conferences. I also want to thank those of you who donate to research. That is important too. And we, um, you know, we always say we can't have research without the organization, but research is really important as well. And so for those of you who do make those donations, thank you. And also for those of you who show up, who show interest, who interact with our scientists and researchers who um, come with an open mind, ready to hear what we're doing, we thank you. You're important to this organization and we couldn't do it without you. So thanks. I hope that that fills you with some excitement tonight like it does me. Um, special thanks to all of the doctors who have donated time and energy and to our research committee. So, thank you. Great. Um, thank you again, Maggie, for that great presentation. If anyone has any questions about our research committee, you can just put them in the Q&A box now and we'll be responding to them in the next few minutes. Our next session is the Ask the Expert panel, um, which will be starting in about four minutes. So we have a couple minute break. Um, I'll see you guys in a few minutes. <laughs>